Well, hi, friends at CFC. It is really great to have this opportunity to be sharing with you in what I know has been the craziest time of our lives. And it's okay. I am not going to endlessly use that word that we have come to despise. I'm talking about the COVID word. I'm not going to use that constantly through this teaching, but I just want to acknowledge that this has been such a challenging season. It's felt like a Bruce Willis disaster movie, except that so far, Bruce has not come to rescue us. More seriously, I know that this has been a time of uncertainty, fear, economic concerns about jobs and businesses, and obviously health concerns and grief as well. And I want you to know that through these recent months that our friends there at CFC, you've been on our hearts on our minds and in our prayers. Well, I've been asked to look at the subject of Sabbath and rest. And when I got that brief, I was both excited and also challenged. You know, whenever a preacher preaches about any subject, she or he always feels the tension of their own imperfection in that particular area. I'm asked to talk about prayer and I remember again quickly that I often fall asleep while praying. I'm asked to talk about motivation and a friend of mine one time said that he had never done anything out of 100% pure motives and I feel that challenge as well. I'm asked to talk about commitment and I realize once again that I am not someone who's arrived in that area but I'm very much a fellow traveler. But when I come to the subject of Sabbath and rest, I feel my own sense of lack with great keenness because frankly, I am someone who is energized by productivity. I love what I do most of the time. And as an activist, I don't find it very easy to slow down, to relax. Uh, years ago, uh, back in the 1970s, do you remember that era? Many of us will remember it as a time of fabulous music and thoroughly evil fashions. Well, back in the 70s, a man called Tim Hansel wrote a book uh, called When I Relax, I Feel Guilty. And I remember buying the book and resonating immediately with that amazing title. That's where many of us find ourselves. As I prepared for this message, as I've been studying, I want you to know that God has deeply and profoundly challenged me about my own lifestyle, about the rhythm of my own everyday life. And so please know that as we look at this subject together, I share with you as a fellow traveler and not in any way as an expert or as someone who has remotely arrived in these areas. That said, we must know that the principles of Sabbath and rest that are found in Scripture, they are not just idealized concepts that um, bear no relationship to our fast-paced modern world, but they are creation principles that God, as we will see, has given for our blessing and benefit. And so as we come to this subject, we don't come to it to just gather some theory, but we come to it with hearts open to the Holy Spirit saying, God, interrupt me, enable me to recalibrate my days according to your ways. Having given our lives to Jesus, we don't want to gradually, incrementally, almost unconsciously take them back again. James, writing in his epistle, warns us about that kind of frenetic activity where we make our plans ignorant of the purposes of God, uh, not concerned about his will in our lives. That's true in the macro, and it's also true in the micro. So may we be uh, faithful to God's word and ready to respond to it as we look at this together. I'd like us to look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, famous, well-known words from Jesus 
words of comfort, but I suggest also words of challenge, where he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And to get another uh, camera angle on those words, if I can put it like that, I'd like us to turn to Eugene Peterson's message and scan back to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 25. I find Peterson's rendition of this very refreshing. I hope you will too. Abruptly, Jesus broke into prayer. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've concealed your ways from sophisticates and know-it-alls, but spelled them out clearly to ordinary people. Yes, Father, that's the way you like to work. Jesus resumed talking to the people, but now tenderly. The Father has given all these things to do, given me all these things to do and say. This is a unique father-son operation coming out of father and son intimacies and knowledge. No one knows the son the way the father does, nor the father the way the son does. But I'm not keeping it to myself. I'm ready to go over it line by line with anyone willing to listen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I've talked about it before at CFC. I've been, uh, been privileged to, to visit the church there on many occasions. It happened some years ago when I was traveling to San Jose and I was connecting through Los Angeles airport. The connection time was long. I don't know about you, but I'm not thrilled by airports. Remember airports when we used to be able to travel? And airports are, for me, emotional black holes filled with people who frankly are only there because they want to be somewhere else. And so I was feeling a bit sullen and a bit tired and jet lagged as I sat in Los Angeles airport when suddenly the uh, airport announcer uh, captured my attention speaking over the tannoy, uh, paging passenger Lucas, paging Phoenix passenger Lucas, uh, please go immediately to gate 28A where your plane is waiting to depart. And there was a, an edge to the voice that really caught my attention. I could imagine my fellow passengers sitting tetchily waiting on the runway, perhaps burning my bags as they waited for me with great impatience. And so I picked up my carry-on and I started to sprint through the airport. Where's gate 28A? I need to get there as fast as possible. And as I'm sprinting along, just trying to cut through the crowds, I suddenly realized I had a revelation. I'm not going to Phoenix. No, I'm going to San Jose. This passenger Lucas who was being called, that was not me. And so rather sheepishly, with some embarrassment, I gradually slowed down and turned and went back to the inviting plastic bucket seat to continue to wait for my flight to San Jose. You see, because of my weariness, I had reacted rather than responded. I'd got myself in a big sweat about something that I didn't really need to be concerned about. Take a, take a, a portrait in your mind of that sweating, dashing, agitated, nervous figure that was me charging through the airport. And I suggest that that's the way most of us are much of the time. We live incredibly busy, frantic, fearful, fragmented, distracted lives. There is something very wrong with the way that we typically do life. And it's, it's as if 
we've almost ex come to expect it to be that way. In fact, being busy is something of a, a status, really. People expect us to be busy and overworked. It's as if we feel like if we're busy, therefore we're important. I've got things to do. I've got people to see. I've got places to go. And if we're not busy, then perhaps there's a sense of emptiness and redundancy about that. We're almost embarrassed to admit it. There's something wrong with the way that we're doing life. The philosopher Brian Chu Han, he ends his book called The Burnout Society with this haunting observation about people in the Western world. He says, they are too alive to die and too dead to live. What challenging words. And I've found in my own life, forgive all the personal confession, but I can get into a default mode of busyness and weariness where I simply say when people ask me how I'm doing, I say, well, I'm tired because that's the way I usually am. I'm just tired. And a couple of years ago, I went on holiday with some good friends, had a very refreshing time. It was wonderful. I came back and the day after I got back from the holiday, someone asked me, how you doing, Jeff? And without even thinking, I said, well, I'm tired. And then I thought, actually, I'm not. But I'd got myself locked in to that tiredness condition. It had almost become my default. Some years ago, on one of our trips to the Holy Land, we were in Jerusalem and it was the evening of Shabbat, of Sabbath, and our guide was explaining how most of the city would shut down, how the traffic would, would just crawl to nothing, and um, where families would now gather for the Shabbat meal, many of them going to hotels for the weekend to celebrate family time and to cease to stop their regular labor. The word Shabbat or Sabbath means stop. I remember feeling somewhat envious about all of that. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And then I remembered some words from Stanley Hauerwas, a um, great theological and social thinker. And he talked about a shift in American culture when one day back in 1963 in Greenville, South Carolina, Howell says everything changed. He said it was there in South Carolina in defiance of the state's time-honored laws that the cinema, the theater, opened on Sunday. He said seven of us, regular attenders of the Methodist Youth Fellowship at Buncombe Street Church, made a pact to enter the front door of the church, be seen, then quietly slip out the back door and join John Wayne at the Fox. That evening has come to represent a watershed in the history of Christendom, South Carolina style. On that night, Greenville, South Carolina, the last pocket of resistance to secularity in the Western world, served notice that it would no longer be a prop for the church. There would be no more free passes for the church, no more free rides. The theatre went head to head with the church over who would provide the worldview for the young. That night in 1963, the cinema won the opening skirmish. The loss of Sabbath. And in sharing all of this, we're not just looking around at the wider world and saying, well, there's a big problem in our culture, because frankly, the problem is ours. It's been said that for many of us, our busyness means that the great danger to us is not that we will renounce our faith, but rather it is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of our faith. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them, says John Mark Comer in his excellent book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Gordon Dahl has said very tellingly, we tend to worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. Our relationships disintegrate faster than we can keep them in repair, and our lifestyles resemble a cast of characters in search of a plot. When we lose Sabbath, 
when we lose rest, that is part of our loss of what Tom Wright calls the big fat story of God. And we get dislocated from our identity, dislocated from our purpose and fragmented in our souls as a result. Well, there's so much that we could say about Sabbath and rest, but here's the first principle I'd like to share with you. First of all, we need to reclaim Sabbath and rest as a creation principle and as a gift from God. In the book of Genesis, we have this amazing portrait of God working and resting. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And so we've got this remarkable picture of a restful creator. And of course, that call to Sabbath, which was given to the Jewish people, not to the wider world, that call to Sabbath is enshrined in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The word holy there means set apart or sanctified. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. I want us to remember that phrase, a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now we know, don't we, that the concept of Sabbath, the concept of the law, was completely disfigured by legalists like the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees who created a labyrinth of rules and regulations, 631 rules just about eating alone. And they tried to catch Jesus out when he did good and wonderful things on the Sabbath. <clears throat> and we read in Mark 2 and verse 27 and 28, the Sabbath, Jesus says, was made for man not man for the Sabbath. But I want us to notice something there, because Jesus does say the Sabbath was made for man, for women and men, for humanity. It's a gift, not a curse. In Colossians, we read the Apostle Paul there confronting a legalistic approach to Sabbath. He says in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So Paul is confronting this idea that Sabbath keeping was the source of salvation, or that keeping the law would save us. And in fact, in Romans chapter 14, Paul identifies a slavish attitude towards Sabbath keeping as, um, as something that is perhaps immature. And he offers freedom in this. He says one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He's offering freedom there. What we're talking here is not about Sabbatarianism, where we view Sabbath in a legalistic view, way, but rather seeing Sabbath and rest as a gift from God, not as an option to be received, but rather as a divine rhythm to be embraced and it's something very beautiful. Dan Allender in his book on Sabbath says the Sabbath is an invitation to enter delight. The Sabbath when experienced as God intended is the best day of our lives. Without question or thought it's the best day of the week. It's the day we anticipate on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, the day we remember on Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. He says Sabbath is the holy time where we feast, play, dance, have sex, sing, pray, laugh, tell stories, read, paint, walk, and watch creation in all its fullness. Few people are willing to enter the Sabbath and sanctify it to make it holy because a full day of delight and joy is more than most people can bear in a lifetime, let alone a week. So let's realize that there is 
something wrong with the way we live and we need to reclaim Sabbath, rhythm, rest as a gift from God and not something negative or prohibitive or even religious because as we're going to see in just a moment it is a Sabbath to the Lord but this is far more than than empty religious observance of a legal principle. Secondly then, let's see right away that Sabbath is not just about schedule or time off or even rhythm, but it is rooted in its relationship to God. Right back in Genesis, we see that God rested and in the law, the Sabbath was declared as being holy to the Lord. Let's go back to that passage in Mark chapter 2. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, said Jesus. And then he says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now that was a verbal stun grenade to his listeners because the Sabbath was ordained by the Creator God. No human being could touch it. And now Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, of Daniel, the son of man of the book of Revelation. Now Jesus is making this stunning declaration that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Surely um, a statement of his divinity crouched, if you will, in those words. But notice too that he is Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is related to God. And as we look back at the words in Matthew, we hear an invitation from Jesus that is very personal. He says, come to me, take my yoke, let me teach you. Uh, to go back to Eugene uh, Peters, Peterson's words, come to me, get away with me. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me, work with me, watch how I do it. You see, this is not just about reorganizing our diaries, our calendars, our schedule, but this Sabbath principle that we're called to walk in is about a lifestyle which is rooted in relationship with Jesus and allowing him to teach us how to live out our days. And Jesus says something rather surprising here. He says, take my yoke take my yoke upon you. Now, when Jesus spoke about a yoke, um, that might have triggered one or of three images in the minds of his listeners, because the word yoke in Jesus' day, the word zygos, it was the wooden frame joining two animals together, normally oxen, beasts of burden for pulling heavy loads. So when Jesus said, take my yoke, some might have thought he was talking about work. Secondly, the yoke was a word or yoke was a word that was used to speak of oppression. And so in the Bible, a yoke signaled servitude to a conqueror. And we read in Jeremiah chapter 27 about an oppressive yoke. We read about that in Lamentations as well. But there was a third application of the word yoke, the yoke was the teaching of a rabbi. A rabbi would have a yoke, a, a halakha, the path that one walks. And when you aligned yourself with a rabbi, you agreed that you were going to take their yoke, their teaching, the body of principles associated with them, their lifestyle, you would take that yoke upon you. And Jesus invites us Again, I need to affirm this, not just to reorganize our schedules, but to come to him and allow his yoke, his rhythm of life to be uh, replicated in our lives. Doug Webster says, his easy yoke is neither cheap nor convenient. The surprising promise of the easy yoke was meant to free us from a self-serving, meritorious, performance-based religion. It is easy in that it frees us from the burden of self-centeredness liberates us from the load of self-righteousness and frees us to live in the way that God intended us to live. The easy yoke sounds like an oxymoron because plowing a field or pulling a load is hard work 
And nowhere does Jesus promise soft ground for tilling or level paths for bearing the load. What he does promise is a relationship with himself. The demands are great, but the relationship with Jesus makes the burden light. You see, Webster is taking the view that Jesus used the word yoke interchangeably to say, yes, it's being yoked together with him, like those oxen. It's also about embracing his teaching. Sabbath is about Jesus and being with him and allowing his peace and his work in our lives to bring rest to our souls. That immediately challenges me to ask the question, in coming to Jesus, have we got the right Jesus? Because notice here, the moment Jesus says, come to me, he reveals his character. He says, I am meek and lowly of heart. He is not the oppressor. He doesn't come to threaten us, but he invites us to be with him and find rest in our souls as a result. I've got two grandsons. I've occasionally talked about them in CFC, and I try not to talk about them too often because we grandparents can be decidedly boring with our 11 million photographs on our iPhones for your delight. But I remember when our first grandson Stanley was born and I was talking to Kelly and Ben about him and how he would grow up. And I remember saying to them, do give him Jesus. But then I qualified that by saying, give him the right Jesus. Give him the Jesus who is, yes, the Lion of Judah, but he is also the Lamb. He is the one who is meek and lowly of heart. And if we've got the wrong Jesus in our hearts and minds, then we will be driven people. And how often history has corrupted the character of Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great martyr of the Nazi oppression, he said the church's main task is to wash the face of Jesus. And as we're thinking about Sabbath and a Sabbath to the Lord, why not just step back for a moment and ask God once again to give you, why don't we ask God to give us a fresh revelation of the character and the nature of Jesus? However much we know of him, why don't we take a step to open our hearts and say, God, show me Jesus afresh because we want to know him better to use the language of the Apostle Paul in one of his prayers for the churches. Here's the third thing. The third thing is that Sabbath creates reflection and refueling. It brings rest and rhythm into our lives. There's a story that comes from the height of British colonialism. An English traveler landed in Africa intent on a very rapid journey into the jungle, and he charters some local porters to help him uh, carry his supplies and after an exhausting day of travel all on foot and a pretty fitful night's sleep he gets up to continue the journey and the porters refuse to go with him and he begins to cajole them and bribe them and plead with them but nothing works they will not move an inch that morning and he says why why can't we carry on with our journey and the answer was given they are waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies uh, Letty Kalman in her telling of the story she said the whirling rushing life which so many of us live does for us what that first march did for those four tribesmen poor tribesmen the difference they knew that they needed to restore life's balance often we do not in Jewish thinking Work and rest is about rhythm. And the seventh day for the Jew is about something called manuha. Manuha is where you rest, you sit down, but you also celebrate. You look back on the week's work and you rejoice about what has been done. Rabbi Abraham Heschel says it's a restfulness that's, a, that's also a celebration of a job well done. And this rhythm 
uh, this opportunity for reflection, Sabbath brings that to us. Andrew Sullivan, on an essay for New York Times magazine, it was called, um, I Used to Be a Human Being. And he said, the Judeo-Christian tradition recognized a critical distinction and tension between noise and silence, between getting through the day and getting a grip on one's whole life. The Sabbath, the Jewish institution co-opted by Christianity, was a moment of calm to reflect on our lives in the light of eternity. It helped define much of Western public life once a week for centuries, only to dissipate with scarcely a passing regret into the commercial cacophony of the past couple of decades. It reflected a now battered belief that a sustained, sustained spiritual life is simply unfeasible for most mortals without those refuges from noise and work to buffer us and remind us of who we really are. Reflection, rhythm, restatement of identity, and also replenishment. There's been a lot of work done on time management in recent years, and that's really good. But we also need to ask, what is it that refuels us personally? And we're all different. What refuels us spiritually, physically, emotionally, intellectually? It might be really good this week to sit down and answer those questions. What puts fuel in your tank? Because if we're not replenishing, we may have our time well organized, but we'll still feel like we're running on empty. Let's ask God to help us to think differently about rest and rhythm and refueling. Well, the fourth and the last thing is this, and that is that Sabbath calls for intentionality and discipline. It is commanded as a creation principle. Have you ever wondered why God commanded Sabbath? I'm wondering if it's because in our desire to accumulate and achieve, we can cancel out play, we can cancel out worship, because of the oldest sin in the book. The oldest sin in the book was, I want that piece of fruit, wanting what they didn't need. And maybe that's why God commands Sabbath in our lives, because in our rush to accumulate, to work harder, to be more productive, we stray into the realm of consuming forbidden fruit and we slowly kill ourselves as a result of doing that. Let's face the fact that establishing Sabbath and rest in our lives is not easy. Ronald Rollheiser says, it's no easy task to walk this earth and find peace. Inside of us, it would seem something is at odds with the very rhythm of things and we're forever restless, dissatisfied, frustrating, frustrated and aching. We're so overcharged with desire that it's hard to come to simple rest. This is difficult. Eugene Peterson said the kingdom of self is heavily defended territory, but we have got to take steps. I mentioned earlier that if we don't, we're slowly killing ourselves. Let's elaborate on that. It's been said that if we don't allow for a rhythm of rest in our daily lives, in our overly busy lives, illness becomes our Sabbath. It forces us to stop our pneumonia, our cancer, our heart attack, they will create Sabbaths for us. To be a people of rest is to step out of the relentless march of the crowd. The Old Testament scholarman Walter Brueggemann has said that Sabbath is an act of resistance. It's an act where we say, no, I'm going to be disciplined and diligent and I will rest not just because of inclination, but because this is obedience to what God has commanded in terms of establishing healthy rhythm in my life. I mentioned airports at the beginning of this message. One time I was on an airplane when uh, throughout the nine hour flight, a delightful young child was shouting and screaming for most of it, much to the exasperation of the other passengers. By the way, if that ever happens to you, and I remind myself as well, please be gracious and compassionate, uh, not only to the child, but also to the parents, because these moments can be very difficult. But they were trying to hush this 
little child who kept on shouting and screaming. And in the end, she just yelled at the top of her voice, it's no good, I just can't be quiet. And I think if we're not careful, we can surrender to that kind of attitude. All of this, all of this call to rhythm and rest is, well, that's fine, but I, I just can't do it. But if the Bible calls us to responsibility about these things, surely then we are, we have to face the fact that we can, we can be obedient, we can respond. If we're not careful, we can live under our schedule as if we're totally powerless to change anything. We can even hide behind our busyness because it gives us, it gives us such a, a, a fast-paced life that we don't have time to stop and think and even face what we have become. And perhaps we just need to take some baby steps, some techno solitude of, of turning things off. I mean, like turning, turning our phone off for a while so that the Pavlovian beeps don't summon and distract us and turning off browser notifications and email notifications and maybe turning our smartphones into non-smartphones where we're not constantly online. It's been said that the, uh, the average person touches their phone 2,600 times a day. I don't know where these statistics come from, but if that's true, it is pretty challenging, even horrifying. Let's build technology breaks into our schedule, both at work and at home, and it's been suggested that technology breaks, if they're gonna be meaningful, need to be between one to three hours at a time so that we can engage um, wholeheartedly, single-mindedly in other areas of life. Perhaps let's avoid email at the beginning and at the end of the day. We need to reject the mantra that says, don't just stand there, do something. And we need to embrace, don't just do something, stand there. But whatever this means for each one of us, it is so vital that we hear what God is saying to us. And again, I challenge my own heart and take steps now to establish Sabbath and rhythm. Let's not delay this. Let's not see this as being something that's unreachable for us. Fine for everybody else, but no, I just can't do that right now. Paul Tournier has said, most people spend their entire lives indefinitely preparing to live. Let's not indefinitely prepare to live. Let's take action. Let's take hold of now. In the Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis challenges us to take hold of now. He says this, the present is the point which touches eternity. The future is, of all things, least like eternity. Nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks to the past and love to the present. Fear, avarice, lust and ambition look ahead. God's enemies want a whole race perpetually in pursuit of the rainbow's end. Never honest, nor kind, nor happy now. In reviewing uh, this message, let's come back again to reaffirm these truths, that there's something wrong with the way that we typically live. We need to embrace Sabbath as a, uh, a creation principle and as a gift from God. <clears throat> we need to see it not just as something about recalibrating our schedule, but it's a Sabbath to the Lord. We need to ask Jesus personally to teach us individually what this means. We need to come to him. We need to see that Sabbath will create opportunity for refueling and reflection and recalibration in our lives. But it's gonna take, it's gonna take some diligence, some effort, some intentionality and some discipline. Let me close this time, CFC family, with some words from Wilfred Peterson, who wrote this prayer about slowing down. <clears throat> Slow me down, Lord. Ease the pounding of my heart by the quieting of my mind. Steady my hurried pace with the vision of the eternal reach of time. Give me, amid the confusion of the day, the calmness of the everlasting hills. Break the tensions of my nerves and muscles with the soothing music of the singing streams that live in my memory. 
teach me the art of taking minute vacations, of slowing down to look at a flower, to chat with a friend, to pat a dog, to smile at a child, to read a few lines from a good book. Slow me down, Lord, and inspire me to send my roots deep into the soil of life's enduring values so that I may grow toward my greater destiny. Remind me each day that the race is not always to the swift, that there is more to life than increasing its speed. Let me look upward to the towering oak and know that it grew great and strong because it grew slowly and well. Once again, CFC friends, thank you for allowing me to share with you. May you, may I, may all of us come to grips with the reality that God wants us to be a people of Sabbath and rest. May we receive that gift gladly from him, unwrap the gift and explore ways that we can enjoy that in our ongoing lives. But let's take action now. God bless you.